In Norway, there are still hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles of forest. The further north you go, the more the forest is pine. If you're in the UK, down in the south, we have a lot of deciduous forests. That's trees with broad leaves, big round leaves, flat leaves. And as you go further north, there are fewer deciduous broadleaf forests and the trees often become more and more coniferous. The ones that have pine cones, coniferous cones and pine needles. In Norway, most of it is much further north than, uh, than the UK. And so being further north, it gets very, very cold. But there are still hundreds and hundreds of miles, as I've said, of woodland, of forest, thick, dense forest. And if you've ever been into a proper pine forest, you know just how dark it can get in there. The trunks of the pine trees grow closer together and the pine needles on the floor stop many things from growing up. They're very peaceful places. They can be very sheltered places. The ground between the trees is a soft bed of pine needles that once they're lying flat is spongy and soft to walk on and soft to lie down and even sleep on. But there was once a family a while back, a long time back in history, once upon a time long, long ago, some people might say it was. And they lived on the edge of a great, big, deep, dark, pine forest in Norway. They were very poor and the father worked as a woodcutter and he would earn money by going out and chopping down trees and chopping them up and then either selling the firewood or making them into planks or logs and selling that. He was married and had a wife and he had three sons of differing ages. But one day he was out, out chopping down trees and he was knocking on a bit and out chopping down trees Chop, 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 he went with his huge, broad-bladed felling axe, bringing down great big trees, and then carefully allowing the smaller ones to grow up. Proper forest management, that's what we're talking about. But he swung his axe at the base of a big, thick tree trunk. <clears throat> oh, ah, oh, he'd done himself a mischief. His back hurt, it twisted, it crunched, it groaned, it fixed him in place. Oh, I've hurt my back. Oh, his back had gone and neither could he straighten up nor could he crouch forward. And so using his axe as a walking stick, he hobbled back home. Oh dear, said his wife, you've done yourself a mischief. You've been chopping too hard at those trees. We're gonna have to straighten you out over a period of days, if not weeks. And he lay down on his side on the hard floor and she made a hot mustard plaster. Now, what I mean by that is, these days, if you have a plaster, if you have a cut, it's a sticky thing with a bit of sort of uh, gauze foam in the middle to cover up a, uh, a cut to protect it or to bring the skin back together. But in the olden days, a plaster might be made from brown paper. It then might have all sorts of gooey things smeared on it. And then that brown paper plaster <coughs> would go onto a wound or might go on to affected muscles or joints, so that whatever you'd, gooey stuff you'd smeared onto that brown paper would then soak in to the injured area. Oh, his back hurt, the base of his back. Oh my giddy aunt, it was painful. So this mustard plaster was made and it was warming and it was soothing and his wife carefully put it on the base of his back. Oh, he said, as he felt the lightest of touches. But as it sat there stuck on his back, it began, the heat began to drift and soak into his spine and into the muscles there and began to relax them and relieve them. You've got to stay there for three days, she said. When you're straight enough, then we'll roll you onto your black, onto your black, onto your back, and you can sleep on the hard wooden floor until your back is better. But what are we going to do? said the woodcutter in an uncharacteristically Yorkshire, Yorkshire accent for a Norwegian man. What are we going to do? We're a very poor family and we need to get wood cut down to sell. And then the husband and wife turned round and looked at the boys and said, lads, that's him, not her, they didn't have the same voice. Just, lads, you've got to go, listen to your father. Lads, you've got to go out and you've got to cut down trees 
and you've got to go and sell them. I can sort out the business side in a little bit, but we've got to keep cutting trees down. My oldest son, you must take my axe and you will go out and cut down a tree and get the oss and drag it back here. So the oldest son went out. One thing, said his father, don't go into the troll wood. That's where the biggest and best trees are, but that is where the trolls live. Mind you, in my day, I've dealt with plenty of trolls, sometimes five or six a day. Good luck, lad. Don't worry, father, said the oldest teenage gangly one, whose voice was going a bit wobbly. Don't worry, father, I shall cut down the biggest tree in the forest and use the horse to drag it back here. And off he went, axe over his shoulder, which is not how you should carry an axe. There is a much safer way to carry an axe. But in all good fairy stories, woodcutters sling an axe over, your shoulder, over their shoulders and off he went. Now he wanted to make his parents proud and he wanted to show how adult and how grown up he was and how he could bring back the biggest tree in the forest. So totally ignoring his father's advice about not going to the troll wood, he went deep, deep into the forest. And the deeper he went, the darker the forest got, but the bigger the trees got as well. Here is a small axe. You don't carry an axe like that. Imagine what happens if you fall over. I mean, this is only a tiny hatchet, but you know, if I hold it like that, it looks bigger. There we go. You carry an axe like this. You hold it like that and you hold it down by your side. If you fall over, the axe blade hits the ground and does not hit you. It's a nice little hatchet by that, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, available from all good DIY stores, Wilkinson Swords. And that is also, being the Viking that I am, what I use to shave with, you may be interested to know. Everything I say is true. Deep in the troll wood, the eldest son found that what he believed to be the greatest tree in the forest. And he thought, we'll earn quite a lot of money from this tree. If I can just chop it down, I'll get the oss to help me. That's a horse in a ridiculous accent. I'll get the horse, I'll get the oss to help me drag it back through the forest. And then when father's better, he can show me how to cut it into planks and logs. So with his great big axe, not a tiddler like that, a great big felling axe, he lifted it up over his shoulder and the first huge swing, whack, cut a great chunk out of the side. The echoes of that first cut bounced through the forest and through the trees and back to him. And almost immediately there was a rumbling and crunching sound. And then the sun was blotted out as walking up next to the woodcutter's eldest son was an enormous troll. It was huge, almost as big as the trees themselves. Its legs were like tree trunk, its skin was like bark, and as it peered down with its tiny little eyes, peered down to look at him, it bellowed, Who's cutting down my trees and my forest? Get out of here, or I will eat you. Of course, the lad, being a sensible lad, actually, his knees rattling and shaking and quaking, looked up, looked up at the huge forest troll and throwing the axe over his shoulder in panic, best way to escape the weapon, fling, he ran off home, through the door, <coughs> mother, father, there was a troll. I told you son, don't go to the troll wood. Anyway, why didn't you see him off? He was huge, father, ha, said his father. I've seen off many a troll in my day, sometimes seven or eight every day. Now what are we going to do? I'm not going out there again, father. But the middle-sized son said, <laughs> in a less weird voice, the middle-sized son said, Father, I will go out and I will bring back the, a, a big tree, perhaps not the biggest tree in the forest if it belongs to a troll, but I will bring back a big tree. Well done, lad. See if you can do any better than your older brother here. Panicked, threw away his axe. Now, I'm running out of axes here. I've only got two left, which is handy for the number of children I had, which is pertinent to the story, as you may find out later. Take my second best axe and go and take it out to the forest. Remember, watch out for trolls. But if you encounter them, remember they're not very bright. They're very big and they're very strong, but they're not very bright. You can sort them out. I used to deal with, deal with nine or ten a day when I was younger. Very well, father. I will, he said. And I will hold the axe properly, just like that man showed me down here by my leg. Not up by my arm, but the video is up here, so he has to do it there. 
So off went the middle child, the middle son. And off he went into the woods, deeper and deeper. And he was looking at the trees and thinking, do you know what, I could probably cut this down and bring this one back quite quickly, but then I'll have to come back and cut another small one down. It does take ages for the horse to drag the tree back. Maybe if I go for a really big tree, then it's just one job, one tree, one drag, and they'll be pleased with me. And I will have done better than my older brother. So sure enough, he went a little bit further and a little bit deeper into the forest. And there he found a huge tree. Perhaps it wasn't quite as big as the one his brother had found, but it was still big, a sizable tree, too big to get on this camera. I'll cut this down, he said. And shouldering his axe, raising it, putting his hands together, zoom, slid down and whack, crack, 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 crack. The echo of that first cut shot through the forest and bounced from tree to tree to tree and back. And as he was raising the axe for a second swing, there was a crunching noise and a sound like a mountain sliding between the trees. And suddenly, there was the troll, enormous, with legs the size of tree trunks and skin like bark, almost as tall as the trees. And it leant down and said, You don't stop cutting down my tree and I will eat you. The lad, poor lad, in fear for his life, hurled the axe behind him, which is a stupid thing to do. Never hurl axes unless you're the proper axe hurling thing, but we'll talk about that another day. <coughs> He hurled the axe over his shoulder and ran home as fast as he could. Got through the door. <coughs> you were right, older brother of mine. You were right. Huge trolls out there. I didn't go where he went. I went for another tree father, but still there was a troll. So what did you do? Did you see it off? They're very big and strong, but they're not very clever, you know, lad. In my day, I used to deal with 11 or 12 of them every day. I'm not going back out there, father, said the, said the middle child. What are we to do for money, mother? said the father. And that's when the youngest son spoke up. And he said, I'll go. I'll take the axe that's left and I'll go and I'll cut down a tree and I'll, and I'll bring it back. I'll, I'll bring it back so that we can still have money. What? Ho, 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 said his middle brother and older brother, two older brothers. They said, you, you. You, you can't go out there. You just spend all day just playing around in the ash, making designs and complicated things that may one day be recognized as calculus. You're not strong enough or brave enough. No, but maybe I'm smart enough, he said. Ah, they said, rubbish, you're the lad. Oh, in fact, he spent all day sitting and drawing in the ash. His name was Ash Lad, Asklad. And that was the name he was known by in the house. That was his nickname. Well, son, said the father, we've only got one ax left. But you take, you take it, you take it out. Now you watch out for them trolls out there. Now remember, if you see a troll, don't get yourself killed, son. But I used to deal with 12 or 13 of them a day when I was young. Very well, father, said the, young, said the youngest boy. And off he went into the forest. Yes, he had the same thoughts. I could cut down these smaller trees, but, but then it's an effort. And also they haven't really grown much yet. We get much more money for a bigger tree. I will go a bit deeper. And so he went deeper into the deep, dark forest. There was a tree, wasn't as big as his brother, his oldest brothers, wasn't as big as, big as the mil, middle uh, brother, just the right size. He reckoned he could chop this one down by himself and then get the horse to drag it back and they could cut it up and sell it. Over his shoulder, he raised the axe, the final axe. Whoom! Whack, crack, 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 crack. First cut, the, the chop, the cracking noise in that first cut echoed, echoed, echoed through the trees, between trunk and trunk to trunk to trunk and back again. And as he was lifting the axe for the second time, sure enough, there was a crunching noise and the sound of something so huge moving through the trees. And suddenly next to him, there was a huge troll with legs like tree trunks and skin like bark. If you don't stop chopping down my trees, I will eat you, said the troll. The boy thought for a second, but instead of flinging the axe over his shoulder and running away, he said, Oh, really? And you think you're strong enough, do you? Right, look at this. And he took off his backpack, put his hand inside and pulled out some cheese that he had brought with him for lunch. Some cheese curds, soft cheese, like, like uh, cottage cheese. A little bit like halloumi 
but a bit more squishy. And he said, if you think you're strong enough, then come along and fight me and eat me. But I, otherwise I will do to you what I'm doing to this stone. And he squeezed his hands together around the cheese and water came out. If I can squeeze water from a stone, imagine what I could squeeze out of you, troll. Ooh. Now, as we've said, trolls are very big and very strong, but they're not very bright. And he was taken in by the boy's, uh, uh, by the boy's trick. Oh, no. Oh, he's, he's from Yorkshire as well. He's not from Yorkshire. He's from London. No, no, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't squeeze me like you're squeezing water out of a stone. I, I, I'm very sorry for interrupting. Um, perhaps I can help you with, uh, with chopping some trees down. Yes, that would be very good. Thank you very much. And so the troll disappeared for a moment and came back with a troll axe. Now a troll axe, if you've never seen one, are enormous. It's made from a whole tree trunk and a mountain's worth of iron on the end. And with his first swipe, he cut down enough wood for the family to burn and sell and build out of for a year. At the end of that, he helped stack it all up <coughs> into a big, nice, neat pile. And he was exhausted. Well, thank you very much. There you go. There's your, uh, there's all your, your, uh, uh, your chopping done. There's some trees for you. That's very good. That's very good. I'm, uh, I'm getting quite hungry, said the troll. No, I would have eaten you, but you're too strong and too terrifying. Maybe. Do you want to come back to my troll cave and have some porridge with me? Yes, please, said the boy. He was very hungry. He just squished up his lunch, and being from a very poor family, they didn't get to eat much very often. And troll porridge is very good porridge. It's the best porridge in the world. And they make it in enormous cauldr cauldrons, and they get wild honey <coughs> from the inside of trees <coughs> and squeeze it. <coughs> straight into the porridge. They can't feel the bees. They've got hands with skin like bark. So the boy, the youngest boy, Asklad, the ash lad, followed him back to his cave. As he was, there, as he was going there, the troll seemed to be looking down at him and wondering. And Ash, the ash lad wondered whether the troll's beginning to think that maybe he wasn't as strong as he thought he was. I know, said the troll could almost hear his brain whirring. I'll get the fire going in my cave. You take the bucket, <clears throat> fill it with water from the well. Now the ash lad looked at this enormous iron cauldron and thought, I can't lift that. But if I can't lift that, then he's gonna realize that I'm not strong. And he's gonna realize that it wasn't stone I was squeezing, it was a trick. Okay, said the, uh, said the boy, but um, do you know what? It doesn't look like that's going to carry enough water. So how about I just pick up your well and bring it inside? No, 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 no I'm all right. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't break my well. Or I'll have to spend ages boring holes down there. We can't get the planning permission these days either. No, no, I'll, I'll get the water, said the troll. Again, tricked into thinking the boy was hugely strong. He dipped the water in, brought it back up, boom. Put it, onto the, put it onto the fire and began to boil the porridge. Tell you what, said the troll, why don't we have an eating contest? All right, said the boy, thinking, I'll have to think my way out of this one again. I cannot lose face. I've got to convince him that I'm bigger, stronger, faster, better in all these ways so he doesn't eat me. Let's see how much porridge we can all eat. <coughs> and if I win, I'll get to eat you. Oh, and if I win, said the boy, <laughs> you, you're tiny. Look at me, I'm enormous, the size of my stomach. You're a tiddler. Yeah, but if I win. Oh, uh, if you win, then you can help yourself to my gold and silver and jewels and treasure. What's hidden behind that stone over there? Sounds good to me, said the ash lad. Dish it up. And as the troll was spooning out great dollops of honeyed troll porridge into bowls, the ash lad emptied out the rest of the things from his backpack, stuffed it up the front of his shirt, and started tucking in. Oh, it's delicious, he said. Oh, I could keep going for ages. Oh, this is lovely, lovely, lovely porridge, Mr. Troll. Are you going to have some more? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll have some more. And as the troll turned away to serve himself some more, quickly the lad <coughs> emptied the rest of his porridge down his front and into the backpack. And every time he did it, <coughs> his stomach got bigger and bigger and bigger, or so the troll thought. 
there was getting a bit of a problem. The backpack was getting full and soon he would run out of space and the troll was still munching on. Oh, said the lad, do you know what? Oh, my stomach's becoming a little bit full at the moment. Oh, do you want to give up then? Do you want to give up and hop in the pot and I'll boil you up? No, 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 no. I know what I need to do. And he reached down to his belt and got his little knife. Don't do this at home, kids. This is a foraging knife, by the way. You can use it for cutting mushrooms and plants and things. It's not a horrific, dangerous troll knife. But he got out his knife, and I'm not going to do this because it'd be dangerous to do that. And he stabbed himself straight in the stomach. Stabbed himself and cut up and down and opened up what the troll thought was his stomach. And porridge went and, and, and poured out. The troll was amazed. How'd you do that? That's amazing. Yes, said the lad. And he then continued to eat the porridge normally. And as the troll wasn't looking, he dumped more in. Of course, it would help the stomach. But he was still eating it. And do you know, when I do this, I can eat as much honeyed porridge as I want. Can you really? Said the troll. Oh, that's great, but it really must hurt. Oh, no, no, no. If you just do it firmly and quickly and open it up, it's fine. It doesn't hurt at all. You sure, said the troll, because if you're tricking me, I will eat you. That's fine. It's fine. All right, said the troll, and got his huge troll knife the size of a sword, picked it up and turned it round, and he looked at the lad one more time. I will eat you, you know. Stabbed himself in the stomach and opened himself up. But instead of the porridge just coming out, lots of troll came out. And the troll, realising he'd been tricked, said, You, you mucky little rat, I'm going to eat you! And fell down dead. The lad was so relieved that he had survived and wasn't going to be eaten uh, by the troll. So he shook out his backpack, went over behind the stone that the troll had indicated, and there, sure enough, was piles of silver and gold and jewels and precious things that the troll had stolen from all the people that he had killed and eaten. All those unlucky travellers, all those unfortunate woodsmen, all those unfortunate milkmaids, all. Oh, he had picked their bones clean and piled up their riches in the corner. Sorry, not even riches. Some of them only had a had a pound coin or two on them. But here was the sum of all that treasure he'd built up. And so the lad scooped that into his backpack, stitching it up hurriedly, and then went home with the axe over his shoulder. Sorry, holding the axe properly, I mean, in a proper safe way. And when he got home, he pushed open the door. Oh, so you're back, said his oldest brother. I see you haven't brought a tree with you. Did you run away from the troll, said his middle brother. You're right, lad. Hope you dealt with the troll if you saw one. I had to deal, I used to deal with 13, 14, even 15 a day sometimes. Yes, said the ash lad. I did meet a troll. I've cut down an acre of forest that's ready to sell. And also I have all of this. And he upended his backpack and the silver and gold and precious jewels scattered out onto the floor. And the family had more than enough money to rebuild the house, to help the dad with his back and get some physiotherapy for sports injuries. And in fact, they bought the forest and then properly managed it. And any trolls coming in then were also properly managed and became woodsmen and helped cut down the trees and things. And they lived happily and sustainably ever after. Thank you.